What if you were to discover you were 32% Eastern European, or 18% African, or 50% South Asian? Consumer DNA testing has skyrocketed in the past few years and shows no signs of slowing. But why are so many so curious about where their genes come from? And might there be some unexpected implications as a result of this interest in our DNA profiles? Joining us now to consider such questions, Timothy Caulfield, professor in the Faculty of Law and the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta, and Deborah So, columnist with Playboy.com and a regular contributor to the Globe and Mail. And we're delighted to have Timothy, you back, and you here, Dr. So, for the first time. Nice to have you both. Check this graph out. This is going to show just an exponential interest in everybody finding out where they're from. Look how that line curves up heading north at the end there. This is representing 12 million people who mostly through things like Ancestry DNA or 23andMe have wanted to find out just where they're from. And Tim, let's start with you. Are you troubled by the rising interest in personal DNA analysis? Well, what I find fascinating about that, as you know, these tests have been around for a while, right? It's not like they're new. Uh, we've been following it really closely at, at the Institute, uh, but they've taken off in the last couple years. And I sense that they've taken off because of ancestry testing. You know, they've been originally sold very much about health, about finding out your predispositions, but and you've seen the ads, right? You know, they've really started emphasizing this ancestry, where you're from, and that seems to be clicking. And I do think they're there are problems with that. What's I'm worried about. Well, I, look, I get it. You know, I've tried it. I've, I've been to these. The, this. Uh, I've, I've had my DNA tested at 23andMe. And what are you? Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> when I first got tested, I was 100% Irish. Steve, you could go to Ireland, you could test a thousand people, and you wouldn't find someone this Irish. Uh, since then, as it's gotten more complicated, my Irishness has dissipated a little, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but. But what I'm troubled about is the marketing strategies, right? You know, I get, I get that this is fun and people are, go, you know, it's a little bit of almost recreational science, but so much of the marketing, so much of the way this is presented is based on the idea that biology matters. Where you're from biologically matters, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I'm troubled with for a bunch of reasons. One is I think that that's just scientifically wrong, right? I think it's wrong. Uh, and I also think that it has the potential to reify race, this idea that there are these biological races that uh, exist, which is also um, scientifically wrong. And I think that that reification process could have real social con uh, consequences. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not denying the science. I've been, you know, had the opportunity to work in this area for a very long time, and I understand there are genetic variations between populations, right? There's no doubt that that, that is the case, right? Um, but what the problem here is that there aren't these discrete populations as these, this advertising often hints that there are. So, yeah, that worries me. A lot to unpack there, but just for those who... I mean, I think everybody knows about this, but I'm a chance that some people don't. Here's, here's some of the encouragement to find out, quote unquote, who you are. Sheldon, go. I wanted to know who I am and where I came from. I did my ancestry DNA and I couldn't wait to get my pie chart. The most shocking result was that I'm 26% Native American. I had no idea. Just to know this is what I'm made of, this is where my ancestors came from, and I absolutely want to know more about my Native American heritage. It's opened up a whole new world for me. Do you absolutely want to know more about who you are? I do. Have you had the test? I haven't had the test yet, but I would love to take it. So you intend to take I it? I plan to take it, yeah. I just haven't had a chance to get around and look at what the different companies are offering. Why do you want to take it? I think it gives us another perspective as to who we are. I mean, part of understanding who we are as individuals is understanding what makes us unique. So I, I totally understand the fascination. I don't think we necessarily have to be afraid of the implications of the test. You must have a pretty good idea of what your percentages are right now, don't you? Probably, yeah. But I think the test, the tests also give you feedback about things like, uh, I don't know, fun little like trivia questions like, do you drink a lot of coffee? Or what kind of sleeper are you? Do you sleep well? So I think it'd be fun to see if those if results match up as to who I actually am. Do you have some results in mind that you wish for? Not really, no. no. I would be curious to see if I am more ethnically diverse than I previously thought. I mean, that's the thing, right? <laughs> As we saw in the commercial there, there was a woman who was, She's you know, happy about delighted it. to discover that she had some indigenous uh, DNA in her. Mm -hmm. Are, do you kind of hope that there's something mysterious in your DNA you don't know about now? Not necessarily, no. Okay. 
Um, is Tim right to be concerned that this is an invitation for people to think about race and ethnicity as biological facts? I can definitely understand Professor Caulfield's concern. Um, and we do, unfortunately, still live in a society where there is racism. So I do understand why it can make people uncomfortable. Um, but I don't think we have to fear the test. I think the concern is more what people do with the findings. Um, you know, my, my concern, I guess, coming from the perspective of a journalist and a science journalist is that science should be able to stand and we shouldn't have to uh, worry about political agendas coming in and, and people trying to either uh, misrepresent what findings are or putting pressure on scientists to either avoid areas of research or to find specific things. So yes, race is a social construct, but there are biological correlates to it that have implications in the real world, and I don't think we should necessarily ignore that. Well, that may dovetail nicely to my next question, which is I've heard you say that there is no such thing as a later hosen gene. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, look, what kind of culture that we're attracted to is that's not biological, right? There's not a gene for the later hosen, right? And there's one, I, I, I pulled that because there's this one ad, I don't know if you've seen it, where uh, this gentleman thinks that he has German heritage, and it turns out he has Irish heritage yeah. or Scottish heritage. Yes. It's Scottish. And then so he, he starts wearing a kilt, right? <laughs> you know, that's scientifically absurd, right? I mean, you don't have a gene for a particular. Um, you know, cultural interest. Um, and I get, you know, this idea of... of Can I push back on that a yeah. little bit? Y you know, there are going to be people from Eastern Europe wh whose origins are in Eastern Europe, uh, maybe Ashkenazi Jewish, who feel Jewish, who feel a, a connection to Jewish culture, and they'll say it's in the genes. You're pushing back on that. and You don't buy it? I, I am pushing back on it to a degree, right? Because mm -hmm. I want to emphasize, I absolutely understand the genetic variation, right? The problem is when we talk about these discrete populations as if they are, are, are genetically, there's a genetic boundary around these, around these communities. And that's just not the case. And, and the ironic thing, if we've learned anything from the Human Genome Project and the, and the advances that have happened in uh, genetic research, is that, first of all, the role between genes and who we are is fantastically complex, more complex than originally anticipated. Uh, but in addition, in addition to that, look, we're all ridiculously genetically similar humans. Um, and when that, you say ridiculously, it's like 99 percent or something. Yeah, 99.5 percent. You know, we're a very young population, right? You know, we we came out of Africa relatively recently, right? So we're very very similar uh, as as a species. Um, and also the, the, the variation between po yes, there's these variations between populations. They're not between races, right? Between populations, and those pop those differences are actually quite small, right? So. When we think of races, and there's interesting research on this, Steve, it's, we think of the, the broad categories, you know, Linnaeus came up with them in, in 1735, right? So it's, it's black, it's white, it's Asian, and it's a fourth category, right? And that fourth category kind of changes around, around the world. And, and, and it's, we gravitate back to those, those social constructs, and I think that, that that's problematic. Do you think it can be laid out as clearly as the way Timothy just said, black, white, Asian, in America, it's Hispanic or indigenous, and you go other places in the world, it's something. Is it that simple? No, definitely not. I mean, race being a social construct does suggest that there is some flexibility there. But again, as I mentioned, there are real correlates to biology, and, and it can be useful to look at the differences. I don't think that acknowledging that there are differences among the races is necessarily harmful. Um, and, and we're not saying that one is necessarily better than the other. So uh, in terms of, say, healthcare, when we look at these differences, again, it may be more appropriate to look at something like genetic clustering as opposed to particular races. but. Research has shown that there are differences in terms of predisposition to particular diseases based on someone's background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, here's an op-ed from the New York Times I want to read a little snippet of right now. David Reich did a piece here. He's the author of Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. Sheldon, let's bring it up. There, thank you. The orthodoxy maintains that the average genetic differences among people grouped according to today's racial terms are so trivial when it comes to any meaningful biological traits that those differences can be ignored. The orthodoxy goes further, holding that we should be anxious about any research into genetic differences among populations. The concern is that such research, no matter how well-intentioned, is located on a slippery slope that leads to the kinds of pseudo-scientific arguments about biological difference that were used in the past to try to justify the slave trade, the eugenics movement, and the Nazis' murder of six million Jews. Uh, Tim, is he onto something here? 
Well, well, he is, and, and as you can imagine, very familiar with this op-ed. It created a huge amount of conversation. Um, he, the, the, the orthodoxy is this idea that race is a, um, is, a, is a biological fiction, right? And I think he, he, if he was here, I think he would agree with that. He would recognize that. But he's saying, and, and I actually agree with this. I, I, I'm a huge advocate, as I think you know, of scientific freedom, freedom of expression. I am not saying that scientists should not be able to research this stuff. But when they do research it, they should use the, the populations that they're talking about the terminology, they should be careful how they use it, they should define the populations in a scientifically appropriate manner. And we've done research on that, right? Our, our research team is, and, and I think there is growing consensus that that is the case. So the concern is that if we don't talk about populations in a scientifically accurate manner, right? Uh, and we use these rough, kind of, uh, these rough kinds of descriptions that you do reify the, the social construct of race in a way that could be socially problematic. And there's evid evidence that suggests that it can be socially problematic. This is the third time you've used the word reify, and I should have asked you the first time, because yeah. I bet a lot of people don't know what it means, and one of them sitting right here. So what are you saying by that? So what I mean by reify, I mean, you know, give meaning to, right? Give meaning to this idea of race, as if, as if it does have meaning. And it's, it's kind of interesting, Steve, because, because what we've seen over the, the life of the Human Genome Project is, is really the, we've blown up the idea of race. It's one of the great things that came out of, you know, finishing uh, the Human Genome Project in the early 2000s, and we heard people say, this has shown that we're all biologically the same. Race is a biological fiction. And then what's happened since then is there's been this increasing in interest in, in variation, right? A population variation, and, and it's re-invited the idea that there are these meaningful differences in the races. Um, and what we've, research has shown, it's hard to study this well, is talking about difference in biological terms does increase the likelihood of racist attitudes. And th there's been some very interesting research to show that. So yeah, it, it's problematic and it can have problematic, it's problematic scientifically and it can, have prob uh, it can be problematic also on a social level. Deborah, how concerned are you that this science will be used to embellish racist arguments that, uh, sad to say, are actually quite timely right now and seem to be in bloom all over the world? I think that is a legitimate concern to have, but at the same time, I think the science should be able to speak for itself and the efforts that we have to fight racism should be going towards calling out the people who are using these findings or biological markers as uh, justifications for their nasty ideas. I don't think acknowledging that we're different necessarily leads to those, just, those ideas. Well, let's understand this a little better. We, we clearly understand what the potential downside is of, of exploiting uh, this information. What do you see as the benefits of researching genetic differences among groups? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there is a difference in terms of uh, medical condition predisposition for among the races. So if so you we, want to know if you get Tay-Sachs or you want to know if uh, this right, kind of thing. prostate cancer, yeah. there's a higher risk in African-American men than European <laughs> men. Same with multiple sclerosis, the risk is higher in Europeans than African-Americans. So. Um, it's not appropriate to take one racial group and generalize from them to all others. Um, and also, uh, there needs to be more research done looking at how different people of different ethnic backgrounds or races um, respond to different medications. And that research won't get done if we go forward with the idea that everybody's the same. Hmm. Part of the trick here is that uh, I gather there's one study that suggests less than 5% of genetic variation is due to group differences. How do we know if 5% is a lot or a little? Well, you know, and I actually agree with Deborah. We don't want to stop the research, right? Um, we want to, I, I'm concerned about how, how that we talk about that research and how it's represented. Um, and when we are all so genetically similar, and we are, that 5% means a lot, right? <laughs> like that's, a, it's, not, it's not, it's 0.5%, it means a lot, right? So when there is variation, it, it can be significant, right? Even look at something like lactose intolerance where you have, it's more common in, in Asian populations. Uh, but it's not exclusive to, right? That's not part, there's not some boundary that says this social construct of race has th these genetic characteristics. Another good example is sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. right? We all often think of that as a trait that, that African Americans have. But it's, it's, it's not African Americans, it's, it's populations that you know, we're exposed to malaria, and so there are uh, other populations that we don't traditionally think of as as black or African American that also have this trait. So it, you know, there aren't these bounds. So uh, we're wrong to think of that as the quote unquote I, black person's disease. Exactly right, it's not exclusive to that, that population. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, uh, you know, I think that there are there, this idea that that there are these discrete populations can have can have social consequences. Hmm. Studies have shown that humans share 99% of DNA with chimps. Is there a fear that small differences will not be insignificant? What do you think? I agree that, well, regardless of what the percentage is, we should be able to talk about differences freely and not have to worry about that being used as some way to justify some sort of bad intentions. Um, so regardless of whether the percentage was larger or smaller, um, these differences exist. And so ultimately, I think that's what the conversation should be about, as opposed to pretending that or trying to minimize what the differences are. Do we have to struggle against the idea of race if we don't want this information to be used for so-called racist purposes? I can see a parallel within, say, the field of neuroscience, and uh, I've written a few times about how sex differences in the brain are being denied. So biological sex differences, there's a huge parallel I see between this conversation and that of sex differences. And so I, I don't think, again, I don't think denying the science and that these differences exist is helpful. It's actually, actually harmful. Do you think we need to struggle against this idea of race? I, I do, and, and I, I, I don't think it's like, like the sexes. You know, the sexes are biologically and there's an, and there's some fluid there, you know, increasingly, right? You know, between gender and and, and sex. Uh, but by Fluidity, saying, I think you meant right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would argue with that, but 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 <laughs> no, I think we're probably on the same page. You know, by how we think of sex as as distinct um, biological categories, race is not a distinct biological category, and these ideas of race that we have now are are scientifically. Uh, uh, Fictions, right? They don't exist uh, as as population constructs, right? They what does exist is variation between populations, right? And there's small variations between populations, uh, and those populations do not necessarily coincide with our social construct of race, right? So, uh, and that social construct of race is what has caused so much problems historically. So, I do think we need to be careful how we talk about race, and when we do research, what population are we actually describing? What what population? Uh, is actually biologically significant, whether you're talking about health or some other kind of, of trait. So, so I think we do need to be careful. As a scientist, uh, do you, I, well, I was going to use a word, but I'll, I'll let you fill in the blank here. I mean, what do you think about the fact that for something that you say essentially doesn't exist, we are obsessed with it in the world today, right? Yeah. We're obsessed about yeah. being what we are and, and for some of us not being what, what he or she is, right? What yeah, do you think of that? We, we are obsessed with it. And, and you can see how these DNA testing this is, has been used. You have white supremacists uh, testing themselves to find out how pure they are. You have you know, a Hungarian uh, member of parliament testing himself to prove that he doesn't have Jewish uh, ancestry, mm -hmm. right? So people are obsessed with these, these social constructs. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, we've done some research on, on this ourselves. Um, people gravitate back to those, those terms. Like, so you start talking about ancestry, you start talking about populations. And as, as people start talking about that research and as the media starts representing that research, it gravitates back to white, black, Asian, mm -hmm. even though the original study was about some discrete population, right? So we, it is a struggle, and I think we have to remind ourselves constantly. Deborah, what's your view of the fact that we seem to be, uh, uh, so many people, I shouldn't say everybody, but so many people seem to be obsessed with this notion of I am this race, and maybe for some more importantly, I'm not that race, and as Timothy says, this notion of race may not even exist. Well, I think it's okay for race to be used as a heuristic. So if we go back to the context of, say, medical care, if we do tend to see a trend within particular races, and again, not to say that it's definitive, but I think it's, it's not harmful to have more information and for maybe a doctor to use that as a way of keeping in mind what might be relevant to their patient. Um, but in terms of whether people put too much emphasis on race, I think there will always be a small minority of people who will be seeking to confirm their racial purity. And if it weren't for genetics or DNA testing that's commercially available, they'll find other ways to do that. Do you find that troubling, that the racial purity seems to be so important to so many? It is troubling. It is. But uh, again, I don't think, and I, I think we are on the same page in that way. I think the science should be allowed to be done, and, and that's not what the problem is. Would you be less troubled by all of this if the category of race were replaced by the notion of genetic clustering? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. We, we held a, a consensus workshop where we tried to um, figure out how to talk about this research. And, and, and I think that that's better, right? I, and I think what you want is you know, the papers to describe the population, the research papers to describe the population they're working on, 
as accurately as possible in a way that makes sense to the methodology they're using. And whether that's ancestry, uh, whether that's genetic clustering, or you know, maybe even the description of a particular region, however that works. But the problem is, as I said before, even when that happens, what, oft what often occurs downstream is it gravitates back to these idea, mm -hmm. this idea of of race. So you do a study on a very small population. Um, and I think it was a study in Am the Amish, for example, right? Uh, and that became a study of white people, right? Hmm. So uh, it's, it's a struggle that we have, to, we have to push back against. And I want to emphasize that there are, is research that shows that this kind of representation does have an impact on how people think about race and racist hmm. attitudes. Which is, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, part of the, part of the issue here, right? Part yeah. of the big problem. He's pushing back against this so-called biology matters notion. What do you say? I think biology does matter. I don't think biology should be seen as threatening. But I understand why people do find it threatening. I think biology conjures up this idea that we are somehow not in control of, the, of our lives or the decisions we make. But I don't think it has to be the case. I think you can still have a lead a meaningful life and still acknowledge that some aspects of who you are are predetermined. I don't want to create conflict where none exists, but I wonder if there's something um, beyond your educational training that brings you to the points of view that you have here. You're a millennial. You're not. Is that part of the point of departure here, Deborah? I don't think so. No? no. I think I'm very, I'm strident about the belief that facts should be able to exist and we should be able to talk about those facts. And it's people's interpretations of facts that are the problem, not the facts themselves. Is there a generational thing going on here in your view? Uh, I don't think so, but I may, perhaps I lived through the, you know, my, my career started right when the Human Genome Project got underway, so I've kind of lived through these, these debates and these discussions, so I probably am hypersensitive <laughs> <laughs> to them, um, but I, I want to emphasize again, you know, Deborah and I agree, I, I, we, if we follow the facts, right, and we, and we well, listen to... We agree on that, Yeah, and we don't agree on science. anything here. <laughs> well, we don't agree, because yeah. I think when we're talking about biology matters, because I, I, I don't think it matters when we're talking about um, who we are, right, who we decide to be, right? Um, but we are biological beings, we so are, how can biology not matter? Right, right. I'm not denying the existence and the importance of genetics, right, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, how genetics impacts how we look and our disease predispositions. But that, Steve, is an incredibly complex story, right? It's an incredibly complex story. Uh, and, and if we've learned anything from the Human Genome Project is that the role of genes and disease, it turned out to be way more, uh, way more complex than we ever imagined, right? So think, and that's with diseases, right? So think mm -hmm. about the role of genes in these other complex human traits, right? Whether you're talking about IQ, personality, um, these kinds of things that are often attributed to, to the races. And, mm -hmm. I just think it's wrong. If we go back to that original graph, though, that we showed at the beginning, it's pretty clear the toothpaste is out of the tube here, right? People are just utterly fascinated by this right now. And the notion that we're going to sort of tamp down their interest in discovering more about what their DNA, I mean, that's not on, is it? It's not going to happen. No, but I, I think we're also overlooking the benefits of genetic testing and the fact that it is so readily available to people now. I think one context in which it is especially helpful is people who are planning a family. I think it can be very beneficial for them to know, you know, even though there are false positives obviously associated with taking the test and it's not definitive, that it can be a helpful piece of information. What about that? that I mean, that, I'm, I'm tempted to tell a, a bit of a personal story here. There is a strand in my, in my own family where half the descendants of one strand of the family, um, half of them will get a degenerative brain disease by the time they're 50. And that's the kind of information you'd kind of like to know, wouldn't you? If you're, if, if you're carrying or if you're not. So we're if we're talking about the health benefits from mm -hmm. the, this testing, and again, I think we've talked about this in the past, yeah. Steve, you know, uh, the data is not very encouraging, right? Unless you have one of the monogenetic diseases or hardly penetrant cancer gene, um, you're not going to get that much, and, which are rare, right? Mm -hmm. You're rare, and you probably know about those. You don't need a genetic test unless you're adopted. Um, you're not getting a lot of useful information from this, these tests. Um, you know, I've done the 23andMe one, and you know, I'm an increased risk for colorectal cancer and certain kinds of cardiovascular diseases. But the, the increase in risk is so small, right? And, and how am I supposed to respond to that? How, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to exercise, not smoke, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. Okay, so you it's know, the same I, for everybody. Yeah, it's the same for everyone, yeah. right? And so, look, 
but I'm not saying people shouldn't have access to this. You know, I think it's I think it's fun information. As I said, it's a little bit of recreational science. And the other thing to remember is the accuracy issue here. Like mm -hmm. these tests are not necessarily that accurate. So, for example, some people, have, uh, some reporters have given their DNA to four different ancestry testing companies and gotten four different backgrounds, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and that's also the case with respect to the health information, right? You know, there's uh, it's how accurate. Is it really? Um, is is it an open question? So, if you're not 100% Irish, what else is in there? Uh, I'm pretty British Isles, you know, <laughs> and I do love Guinness, which is clearly biological. There you go. <laughs> clearly, clearly, good stuff. Deborah So, uh, good of you to join us tonight for the first time. Playboy.com and the Globe and Mail is where you can read Deborah stuff. Timothy Caulfield from the University of Alberta, uh, where uh, he leads the Gwyneth Paltrow fan club out there. Well, no, maybe not exactly. Thanks to both of you for coming in tonight. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.